Aranata, my loved ones, and welcome to another wonderful presentation for, from this prophecy seminar, Unveiling Revelation, Your Life is About to Change Forever. Today we're going to study another topic, another wonderful topic, an amazing topic in regards to the Battle of Armageddon, right? And so before we get started, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity. We thank you for the blessings, for the guidance. We thank you for uh, uh, your patience and your love towards us, Father. We know we thank you because we know that it is through Jesus Christ that we have obtained these things. And so we just ask you, Father, that your spirit guide us and strengthen us as we study this amazing topic in regards to the battle of Armageddon and have a better, clear understanding of the things that are going to be happening. So we thank you, Father, for this blessing, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So our previous presentation, we went into Revelation chapter 16, right? Revelation chapter 16, we studied or we read through verses 1 through number 11, right? And it was talking about the seven plagues of Revelation, talking about those seven plagues. If you remember that they were going to, they undo, they're going to undo or unravel the seven days, the uh, six days of creation in Genesis chapter 1. And so we studied that and we saw that panorama. It was a Quite a fascinating panorama, but now we're going to study the second part of chapter 16, which goes into something that is going to be happening during and before the seven plagues, right? Because remember that seven plagues are going to fall after the close of probation, after the, the mercy and the patience of God has been finished, come to an end with sin. And so what is going to happen as we lead into it? What is going to happen before that goes on? And so that is explained or detailed in Revelation chapter 16, verse number 13. So go with me, please. Revelation chapter 16, verse number 13. Verse 12, finished with the second coming of Jesus Christ, right? As, as the end of that, those plague periods. But now uh, the, John is going to move back a little bit. He's going to now explain to us what is going to happen leading in to that final close of probation and in the end, which is the battle of Armageddon. So let's read it. It says... Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its waters was dried up. Oh, that's verse number 12. I'm sorry. Yeah, we can read it anyway. So that way that the kings for the east might be prepared. That was our last verse that we studied. Look at verse number 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouths of the false prophets. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of uh, the, God, the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I am coming as a thief, says Jesus. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. So here's this panorama, my loved ones, of this final battle, the battle of Armageddon, that is going to be taking place during this time period of the seven plagues of Revelation. But it doesn't start there. It starts before, right? It actually starts before the close of probation. This, and that's what it's trying to explain in detail. It's trying to explain in detail what is going to lead up into this great battle, this great end time battle that is also spoken about in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. And so for that, let's go down and let's study now from verse number 13 forward. And it says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs, coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophets. Now, let's begin here. Three unclean spirits, right? Fallen angels, demons, that are what? Like frogs. Now, of course, this is a simile, right? Figurative languages. They're like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon. Now, Frogs, it's interesting because what, time, what type of animal is a frog, right? So it's an amphibian, but it's an unclean animal. And notice that it says that these spirits like frogs. Now, what do, how do frogs, they are predators, right? How do frogs capture their prey? What's very interesting, my loved ones, Romans chapter 3 verse 13 says, their throat is an open grave and they use their tongues to deceive. So a frog uses his tongue to what? to trap his prey. And so it's telling us that these are like frogs and it's making reference to this deception through tongues. Now watch this, how it continues to break down. Now it says in verse number 13 that these unclean spirits like frogs coming out of what? Out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophets, right? And so here we see these three powers, right? These, these uh, counterfeit trinity, this counterfeit godhead of the dragon, the beast, 
and the false prophets. Now, the dragon we know represented as the devil. He's behind this, this system, this Babylonian system, right? Then it talks about the beast. We know what the beast is. The beast in the context of the Vatican, right? The Vatican City, that beast, that nation that rises up in the papacy as the head, the Antichrist, the one that speaks in the place of Christ. And so uh, I always like to mention before when we're talking about these topics, it, maybe it's the first time you're watching this, Please do not take this personal. This is not an attack on, on Catholics. This is not a, uh, uh, an insult in any way, shape, or form. We're just talking about the system itself, the teachings, the practice, the doctrines of Catholicism through the Vatican, through the papacy, that the Bible clearly teaches that are a distortion and a perversion of Christianity. And so we want to make that sure, right? We're not talking about individuals, about the people. We're talking about the system, the practice, the teachings, and the doctrines that are a distortion. And we are warned about this in Scripture. So we invite you to see the previous presentations also where this is explained in great detail, right? So we're, we're coming to the culmination of this message in regards to and the beast and the, and the Antichrist and all of this. And so we have the dragon, we have the beast. And then it says the mouth of the false prophets. Now, who would this false prophet be? Well, previous presentations, we talked about what a prophet was. And we saw that a prophet is somebody that is an instrument to God to give a message to his people, right? And usually a message of warning about God's people have deviated. And God so sends the prophet to try to tell us, listen, you need to get back on track. And sadly, most prophets are rejected. But it talks here about false prophets, right? And so if the prophet is the one that speaks in the place of God, that means that there's going to be a false prophet in the end times that is going to speak also in the place of the false God. And so once again, we're looking back at this antichrist system, right? Uh, the papacy that believes that they have the prerogatives of God, the power of God, the authority of God here on earth. And so what it's saying is that there's a false prophet that's going to speak in its place. And that takes us back to Revelation chapter 13, right? Because remember what it says in Revelation chapter 13 when it was talking about the second beast. Revelation chapter 13, if you want to join me here. It says, talking about that second beast, it says, He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And so we know that that second beast, talking about the United States of America, right? And so this false prophet, meaning that inside of the United States, there was going to be this movement, right? This apostate Christian movement that is going to what? That is going to carry the, 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 the lantern, right? It's going to carry the, the, the message of who? Of the papacy. In where? Well, beginning here in the United States. It's a false prophet because it's speaking for the false Christ. Is everybody catching me with that, right? Fascinating stuff, my loved ones. And so this is this, this uh, counterfeit Godhead Trinity, right? It's also a counterfeit to the three angels' message, right? You have these three, uh, these three spirits, unclean spirits, coming out of the mouth of them. And so this is a, this is about, it's a counterweight uh, trying to uh, undermine the message of the three angels. And again, remember, these are these two messages that are going out to the world. Either you're listening to the three angels' messages, you're following the three angels' message, or you can be also listening and following to the bind of Babylon, which is represented by these three, this message from these unclean spirits. And so everybody has to choose. If you follow the everlasting gospel, the plan of salvation, then you will receive the seal of God. But if you also follow and obey the wine of Babylon and these unclean spirits, my loved ones, then you will receive the mark of the beast. And so that's what is being portrayed here, right? Now, it also says, my loved ones, if we continue to follow in, it says, for they are spirits, talking about the spirits that come from the mouth of the, from like the spirit of frogs that comes out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. For these are spirits of demons doing what? Performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world. So you're talking about the kings of the earth, the political governors, but it's talking about the whole world of people, tribes, nuns, uh, tongues, and nations to gather them to the battle of the great day of Armageddon, the great day of God Almighty. So what it's trying to present here, my loved ones, it's saying is that because of these deceiving frogs, these deceiving spirits that come out of the mouth of these three, this deception into which signs and marvels and wonders are being presented, this deceives the kings of the earth and the world to do what? To join the enemy, to join this battle against what? Against those faithful people that are wanting to live by the word of God, that are wanting to uphold the principles of God. Now, this is explained, these two verses, I mean, this is just, uh, just, this is fascinating what the Bible is presenting. 
These two verses, 13 and 14, are presented in other ways in different other parts of Scripture. I'm going to share with you some parallel verses that are going to have us to help us to give a better idea, a broader idea, a deeper understanding of what exactly is happening in these end times because this is what is leading up to that battle. This is what's leading up to after the close of probation. Now watch 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. It says, Now the Spirit speaks expressively that in the latter times, that's the end of days, some shall depart from the faith, listening to what? deceiving spirits, so they're leaving, right? They're departing the faithful. That means they're going against the, the principles and they're listening to deceiving spirits and doctrines of what? Of demons. That is hypocrisy shall speak, that in hypocrisy shall speak lies. There again is those lies, those tongues, those lying tongues. And so it's saying what? Again, in the end times, people are going to go away from the faith, from the foundations of faith, and they're going to be listening to these deceiving spirits, right? These doctrines of demons confirming what we're talking about in this sense. This, is, this manifestation is not going to be any, any, just any manifestation. This is going to be used through the powers of darkness, right? Through the, through the enemy is going to be using his demons to carry this message out to the whole world. And so this again, this is deceiving. And this is basically, if you want to think about it, this is the deceiving wine of Babylon. Now, let's look at another verse. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9 says... The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power, false signs, and wonders. Here again, power, false signs, wonders, miracles, and in all deception of what? Of unrighteousness. That means deception of a rightness, meaning people think they're following God's word, but they're really following what? A distorted, perverted, perverted gospel among those who perish. Why? Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. So instead of listening to truth, instead of listening to the foundations of Scripture, it says here they're going by what? They're being caught up, they're being deceived by this power that is being manifested through the lawless one with false signs, wonders, miracles, and all of these things. Now, look at this. Revelation chapter 19, verse 20. All of these verses are parallel verses. Look at what it says. Revelation 19, 20. The beast was captured, and with it, the false prophet. Here again. Here appear the beast and the false prophet, who in its presence had done what? The signs by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those that worshiped the image. Let's keep this up for a second, please. Notice it says the beast was captured and with it the false prophet, right? Again, they're working hand in hand. These are the two beasts who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those that received the mark of the beast. So this false prophet that comes forth from where? Comes forth from the second beast, which is the United States of America, is doing what? Is doing these deceiving signs, right? These deceiving signs that are, that are having people that receive the mark of the beast. So through this deception, through these deceiving spirit signs, miracles, wonders, what is happening is that people are being deceived. The kings of the earth are being deceived. And also the people, not tri uh, tribes, tongue, and people of the earth, they're seeing these miracles, they're seeing these wonders, and they're being caught up into it. And this deception, it says here, is leading them into what? Is leading them into receiving the mark of the beast and worshiping the image. And of course, creating the image, which is what it says in Revelation chapter 13. Now, what? here's the last verse, the last parallel verse that I'm going to share with you. And watch how amazing this comes through. Revelation chapter 13, go with me please. We're going to start on verse number 12. Watch this. Revelation chapter 13 verse 12. And it says, And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So remember, we talked about this. This second beast, this second superpower is going to do what? Is going to restore the power of the first beast. And it's going to force who? It's going to force those that dwell on the earth to what? To worship the first beast, to obey the first beast, right? Whose deadly wound was healed. In other words, the political power of the papacy has been restored through the second beast, right? It's given back its power. That's why it said we read in verse 15 that it gives it breath, right? Right? That means it gives life to the image because in this country we are going to make an image, a reflection of the papacy in what way? In that the papacy does not separate church and state. They believe that these two powers come together. And of course that brings forth persecution and oppression. But what it's saying is that in our country we are going to step away from that, from that constitutional foundation 
found in the Bill of Rights and the First Amendment, which is a separation of church and state, which is what may, has made this country so prosperous and so blessed and all other countries that have followed in the same way, our nation is going to step away from those principles, right? And that's the same thing that we read in Revelation chapter 12, when it says in chapter, in verse 16, that the land or the earth, what is it doing? It's protecting the woman from what? From the, from the persecuting powers in Europe that were joining church and state. The United States separates them. The church now comes, leaves Europe, has a place to breathe, right? God gave that special protection for 1,260 years because if God would not have protected the church, it says, in the wilderness during that time period, the gospel would have been distorted, completely perverted. So God put a special protection around his church. But in this, after that, after 1798, God doesn't have to have that special protection because now she has found a place that has protected her and guided her. But it, then it says in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, that the dragon was what? He was enraged. Then what did he do? He was enraged with the woman. I think that's what we're talking about right now. The, the dragon is enraged with the church, right? But then what happens? And he went to make war with the remnant of her offspring. The remnant, the last part, the offspring, Christ, who do what? who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So it's telling us that this final battle, my loved one, is going to begin here in the United States of America. What's going to happen is that we are this country that when protected religious liberty, protected uh, religious freedoms, right, is now going to do what? Is going to go against it. In other words, the separation of church and state is going to be claimed unconstitutional, right? It's going to move away from it. And people say, well, how is that possible? That can be, oh, yes, it is, my loved ones, because when the Supreme Court says something, it doesn't matter what anybody else says. What they say is basically the law of the land. If they say it's unconstitutional, it's unconstitutional. If they say it's constitutional, it is. And we talked about the breakdown in regards to the legislative, executive, and judicial branks and how it's all composed. Now, let's continue back in Revelation chapter 13. Look at what it says in verse Number uh, 13, talking about this union between the first beast and the second beast, it says, And he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. Let's look at this quote for a minute. Let's keep it up for a second, please. It says, It talking about the second beast, the United States, is going to happen what? There's going to be some performing of great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of the people. Now, those great signs, as was mentioned before, is this fire coming down from heaven to earth in front of the people. And notice what it says here. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, which beast? The first beast who deceives those who dwell on the earth telling them to make an image for the beast that has wounded, that was wounded by the sword and live. In other words, these great signs, these great miracles that are being presented, my loved ones, is what's going to cause the deception, right? People are going to see these signs, they're going to see these miracles, and they're going to be like, oh, in awe. But it says that the great deception, the great sign is making fire come down from heaven to the earth. Now, the first time I saw that phrase, that understanding the second beast in the context of are the United States, that fire is going to come down from heaven. I was thinking, I was thinking, oh, that must be talking about the military power of the United States, right? The missiles and, the, and all this, uh, this, the artillery that the United States has. But then again, you have to remember, we cannot try to interpret or understand uh, biblical principles through necessarily our contemporary thought. We have to let the Bible explain these things, right? We have to let that be the foundation. It doesn't mean that we can't use our current knowledge to understand things. Of course not. We can, but it has to be founded first on Scripture, on the principles of Scripture. And so when you start thinking about what does it mean that fire comes down from heaven, this is where it gets very, very interesting. Because when you think, I started to think, where in the Bible does it talk about fire coming down from heaven? Oh, in a number of places, right? So, for example, when Solomon inaugurated the sanctuary, what happened? He, the sacrifices, fire came down from heaven, representing what? That God accepted the sacrifice of his people. When Elijah was on Mount Carmel, right, fighting the prophets of Baal, what happened? He put a sacrifice, and what came down? Fire came down from heaven. And we see this in a number of different places. And so the fire coming down from heaven is a manifestation of God accepting 
the sacrifice that humans are presenting before him uh, in, in regards to his mercy and his love and his grace, right? That, that sacrifice representing the death of Jesus Christ. But all of those, and there are many other examples in the Bible, right? All of those are represented by what? They're a type or a representation of what? Of the true great day when the fire came down from heaven, which was when? On the day of Pentecost, right? The day of Pentecost we studied earlier in a previous presentation, the ascension of Jesus Christ into heaven. And when Jesus ascended, we saw that wonderful scene of Christ standing before the Father, right? In Revelation chapter 5. And it says that when Christ was standing as a lamb, right? Before the Father, it says that as he was standing there, what happened? The Spirit had gone down to the earth. And so how do we know that the Father accepted the sacrifice of the Son? When the Son presents himself before the Father, what does the Father do? The Holy Spirit, the seven spirits were sent down to the earth on what day? That was on Pentecost, my loved ones. Amen? So what are we talking about here then? This, I mean, this is just mind-blowing. What Scripture is telling us is that in the end times... There was going to be a movement, a false revival, right? Because that's what the Pentecost was, was the descending of the Holy Spirit and the initiation of the church. There was going to be this false manifestation of Pentecost on the churches because this is a religious context. And that false manifestation was going to do what? Was going to deceive those that dwell on the land, on the earth, which would be in the United States, and it would begin to do what? It would begin to push them to see signs and wonders and miracles, and it would push them away, as we're putting all these verses together now, push them away from the true foundational faith of the Bible and move towards more this manifestation, this spiritualistic manifestation of, of these signs and wonders and all these things. Now, to be able to break down or to understand what exactly is going to happen in that false movement and that false uh, manifestation of Pentecost in the end times, we need to go back where? We need to go back to the original Pentecost because remember that the devil is always counterfeiting and falsifying the, what God brings. And so that could give us the key to understanding exactly what is it talking about. So what are we going to do? Go with me, please, to Acts chapter 2. We're going to read the, the original. The God sent fire from heaven on Pentecost, the real movement. And if we study that one, we'll be able to understand the counterfeit one. Acts chapter 2, please go with me, right? Acts chapter 2. Let's read verse number 2, uh, chapter 2, verse number 1. Are you ready? I get excited with this kind of stuff. This is just amazing. When the day of Pentecost had fully come... They were all in with one accord and in one place. Talking about the disciples, right? They were in the upper room. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. Actually, it's a mighty noise, right? And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of what? As of fire. And one sat upon each of them. Notice, the fire came down from heaven. Fire, again, a representation of the? the Holy Spirit, and it says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other what? Other tongues, hmm, as the Spirit gave them utterances. So here it's talking about this what? They were in Pentecost, the disciples and the ones that were in the upper room began to speak what? To speak other tongues. Now, Revelation chapter 16, what it was saying? That there was three unclean spirits like what? Like frogs. And these frogs, what does a frog use to trap its, its prey? It uses its tongue. And so could it be, my loved ones, that what it's telling us here is that there was going to be a false spiritualistic manifestation of Pentecost through false tongues. Now, before we get into this, let's study it. Let's go by what the word says, my loved ones. What is, and this is what we're going to do. We're going to study what is the gift of tongues. And it's not but what I say. It's not but what I thought I was taught. It's not what, what I believe. But what does scripture say in regards to speaking in tongues? Well, let's continue to read. Remember, it's not, not let's go by what scripture says. There is no personal or private interpretation. It says in verse 5, And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, and when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused. Why? 
because everyone heard them speak in his own language or tongues. Amen? So they're all there. They, remember the, fe the Feast of Pentecost, people came, the Jews came from all around the world to come celebrate. It was one of the feast days, the three feast days that they would have to come to Jerusalem. And it says that they were there and they started to come together and they were confused. Why are they confused? Verse number seven. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? So here's the confusion. They were like, wait a minute. Aren't these Galileans? How is it that they're speaking in my language? It says, verse number eight, And how is it that we hear them, each in our own language? And please pay attention to verse number eight. I think this is the key. In, in which our own language, in which we were born. In other words, the disciples who were Galileans, they're not speaking all of these other languages, right? And it says here that they come across and they start speaking and people from different parts hear them speak in their own tongues or languages in which they were born. So these are known languages. This is not some type of, of, of language that nobody knows about, some heavenly language that is a mystery to the world. They knew very clearly because they understood it. Verse number eight. I'm sorry, verse number nine. Now watch how they explain where they're coming from. Parth Parthenians, Medes, Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Pyrgia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya, adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. Look at this. We hear them what? We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. My loved ones, amazing it says here that when the, when, the, when the disciples started to speak and preach out throughout the city, right? They were probably like doing like when we do uh, evangelistic campaigns where you put a number of speakers throughout a city at the same time preaching. The disciples went out and started to preach in all these different languages. And all of these people started to hear. And they were starting to talk among, amongst each other and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. How is it possible that these Galileans are speaking my language. And look, at they come from all different parts of the known world at that time. How is it possible that they can speak in my language, in my known tongue or in my known language? My loved ones, this gift of tongues, my loved ones, is not some type of an, an unknown, uncovered, right, mysterious language that nobody knows about. They clearly understood directly what they were speaking, and that's what the gift of tongues is. It is the supernatural ability to speak a language you did not learn or know. So, for example, I'm fluid in both Spanish and English, learning some Portuguese also. And some people say, hey, Carlos has the gift of tongues. And I'm like, no, I don't. I do not have the gift of tongues. Why? Because I learned both languages. I was born first and learned New English, and then I learned Spanish. And so as being born and knowing both languages, my loved ones, and spending time at different levels, I went to school in both languages. I went to the college and universities and master's degrees in both languages. So I have practice in both of them. But if all of a sudden I was standing here and I started to speak in Mandarin or started to speak in German, that would be a gift of tongues because I have never studied those languages, right? And that's what it's speaking about, my loved ones. It's speaking about this gift of this supernatural ability, what to speak. Now, what is the purpose? Here, this is very important. What is the purpose of the gift of tongues? It says it very clearly here in verse number 11. It says that we hear them speaking in our own tongues or languages, the wonderful works of God. In other words, the speaking of tongues is with what purpose? Is to share the gospel, is to give the gospel to somebody that's not heard it, and you're reaching out to them in what way? In their language, because if not, the communication would be impossible. Either you need to speak the language or you need to have an interpreter, right, that is able to interpret what you're saying, because if not, there would be what? There would be confusion. Now, where did this whole thing of tongues begin? Well, go with me to Genesis chapter 11, right? It's always go back. I mean, Genesis, remember, we talked about this. When you really study Genesis, everything is in Genesis. That is like all the seeds are sowed in Genesis in regards to the end. Look at Genesis chapter 11. Let's look at what it says here. It says, Genesis chapter 11. This is talking about uh, the Tower of Babel. Verse 1. Now the whole earth had what? One language and one speech or one tongue. What language is that? I'm thinking it's Hebrew, but uh, I could be wrong. I wish it would have been Spanish, but it's not. And it says that 
as it came to pass, they journeyed from the east, and they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. They said then to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly, that they may brick for stone, and that they has uh, asphalt for mortar, right? And it says, as they, as they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Verse 5, But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of man had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one. Right? Echap, right? They're unit. They're joined together. Same thing when it says the Lord is one. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they all have one language, and this is what they began to do. Now, nothing that they can propose to do will be held from them. So come, God says in verse number seven, let us go down and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. And so the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the earth that they ceased building the city therefore its name is called what Babel which is the foundation of Babylon because the Lord confused the language of all the earth and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth what is happening here very simple evil is consolidating again as it was during the times of Noah right and so remember in the remember we talked about this in the old testament or the Hebrew scriptures What's happening is that it's that God's doing everything possible to protect the lineage through which the Messiah is going to come. The devil is doing tried the opposite. He's trying to destroy that lineage or that descendancy where the Messiah is going to come forth. And so that's basically the Old Testament, right? God protecting, the devil attacking and trying to destroy and to impede the birth of the Messiah. So that it worked in the flood. But now in the Tower of Babel, now they're doing a different method, right? Now they're building this tower because they want to get up to heaven. They want to avoid too also, right? If God sends another flood, even though they weren't paying attention because God said he wasn't going to do it again with, with water. And so as they build this tower, God sees, uh-oh, evil is consolidating again and they're going to be a threat to what is happening, right? I believe that this is probably around the time of, of, of Abraham, close to this time. And so God's lineage through which his, his Messiah, the son was going to come, was in jeopardy. And so what does he do? He confuses their tongues or their languages. And so let's make, for example, let's say we're working on the Tower of Babel, right? And we're trying to build it. And all of a sudden, uh, I, I, speak, uh, I, I speak to the guy next to me. I say, hey, can you pass me a hammer, right? But I tell it to him in Russian. I'm just making an example, right? And he goes, what, what? He doesn't understand me, right? And so he goes to the guy next to him. Did you hear what this guy was talking about? Did you understand him? And he then speaks to this guy in, in, in Mandarin. And the guy next to him was like, what? I don't understand anything, right? So there's confusion. And so what happens, eventually everything gets frustrated because nobody can understand each other. And whoop, it all falls apart. Everybody goes their own way. Now, did the plan of God work? Of course it worked. It worked perfectly, right? He confused their languages and everybody spread out. And so once again, evil is not consolidated. But you have a problem. That, that plan worked. And that was in place until when? Until the Messiah comes forth. Now, in the gospel, when we read the gospels, the Messiah comes forth, as it says in Revelation 12, verse 5. He comes forth. He's victorious. He ascends into heaven. And now what is the purpose? Now Jesus says, go and make disciples and teach them all the things that I have commanded. Get this message out to the world, right? But now what's the problem? Everybody speaks different languages, right? Everybody's speaking different languages at that time. And so what does God have to do? He has to find a solution to the problem now, being that the disciples are Galileans. He has to find a solution now to how uh, to get the gospel out to everybody to understand it. And so what does God do? The first gift he gives, he manifests in this context, as mentioned, is the gift of tongues. Why? So that those people that do not know of the gospel, they can now hear it in their own language. Problem solved. And I say, amen to that, right? There it is, my loved ones. And that's what it was. That was that manifestation needed for that. Now, now you ask yourselves, is that manifestation as used today as it was at the beginning? I would argue no. Why? Because mo the gospel, the Bible, has been translated now into almost every language and dialect on the earth. So there's very few, it's still, there's still some work to be done, don't get me wrong. But you have missionaries now across all uh, ethnicities, across all countries now, right? That speak all languages and they're reaching and more, far and more. So I'm not saying that it's not used. I know of a number of instances that it has been used, right? But not as, necess not as necessary as it was at the beginning when the gospel was only understood in their one language. And so what we're seeing here, my loved ones, is how then God used this to reach out to others. I know of a missionary that was uh, in a foreign country and he had some issues with his visa. They ended up uh, holding him. 
and he was in this holding cell, and there he was, and, and the Spirit gave him, he didn't speak the other language, obviously, because if not, he wouldn't have been in the trouble that he got into. But anyway, he came across and he started to speak to this gentleman and he started to sp share the gospel with him. And he said, I started to speak in what? In their language, which I did not know. And so my loved ones, gift of tongues, amen? There's where we see it. There's where, where we see it manifested. Now, why do I say this? Because many people today, most Christians, and remember, Sincere Christians that love the Lord believe that the manifestation of the Spirit is what? Is speaking in tongues, right? This glossa, right? This, this, this language that nobody understands. And so well, we can talk about this a whole lot, but this is what is taught. And I'm telling you this because I have a friend, one of my best friends, he was raised in this charismatic movement, right? This charismatic movement where they say and they say that the evidence that you have the Holy Spirit, and this goes back to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, right? Where it's, it's, it's a process, right? It's, it's a maturity. It's a spiritual growing where you receive more and more of the Spirit. And it's not automatically. They say that the evidence that you have received the Holy Spirit is that you're speaking in tongues. And if you don't speak in tongues, what the argument is it, that you do not have the Holy Spirit. And so there's this type of pressure to manifest it because you don't want to be the odd one out, right? You don't want to be like, oh, I haven't received it yet. You want to then find a way. And so what's happening in my loved one is that people believe that this is the manifestation. But that's not what it says here in Scripture. It does not way, say in any way, shape, or form that the gift of tongues is speaking some uh, anything other than a known language on earth that people understand and receive. You can go to Acts chapter 2. You can go to Acts chapter 10, 46, and Acts chapter 19, verse 6, where the three places where the ap practical application of tongues is given, and in any of those, in none of those three do you find anywhere where they are not, languages are not being understood and spoken. Now, people say, well, what about Acts chapter 12, Acts chapter 13, Acts chapter 14? It talks about tongues. Good. I'm glad you mentioned it. Let's go there. Acts chapter 1, first Acts, I'm sorry. Acts chapter, first Acts, we're going to go to Acts chapter 12. Acts, first Acts chapter 12. And I just want to, not, we're not going to go through the whole thing. We're just going to touch on a couple of points. Let's start with first, uh, first Acts chapter 12. And if you're there, look at what it says in verse number 4. There are diversity of gifts, but the same spirit. Now, remember, this is the concept of gifts, right? There are diversity of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the spirit and to another the word of knowledge through the same spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healings by the same Spirit. To another, what? Workings of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discernment of spirits. To another, different kinds of what? Of tongues. And to another, the interpretations of tongues. Pay attention to this verse. But one and the same Spirit works all these things. And I think this is the key. Distributing to each one individually as he wills. It's saying that the Holy Spirit gives these gifts and he, it doesn't say that it's a blanket gift that everybody receives it. It says that everybody receives what? Everybody will receive a different gift. Some people will receive more than one gift. Some people with one gift is suffice. But it is the Holy Spirit who distributes based on the needs of the church and getting the job done, my loved ones. Very clear. Now look at what it says in verse number 27. I mean, this is fascinating. Now, you are the body of Christ and the members individually. And God has appointed this, these in the church. Now watch this. First apostles, prophets, third teachers, miracles, gift of healings, help, administration, variety of tongues. Now I want to answer this question because this is so clear. Verse 29, 1 Corinthians 12, uh, 12 29. Question, are all in, in the church's apostles? Nope. Are all prophets? Nope. Are all teachers? Nope. Are all workers of miracles? Nope. Are all gifts of healings? No. Nope. Do all speak with tongues? No. Do all interpret? No. But earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. Very clear is Paul saying that the Holy Spirit gives these gifts out based on the need, right? 
And so these gifts are not a blanket check. It's not like, oh, if you don't have this gift, you do not have the Holy Spirit. That's what is being taught. And this is what my friend believes, right? One of my best friends. And it's very clear to say, no, we all have different gifts in the same way we have different talents. And God uses them according to his will for what? For the blessing of the church. But what is being taught? And as I said, I have this friend, my, one of my best friends. As I was sharing with him the gospel, as I was learning the gospel, and I was giving him Bible studies, he at one point said, you know, Carlos, you're wasting your time. And I said, what do you mean you're wasting your time? He says, yes, I have committed the unpardonable sin. I'm like, what? I have committed the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And he says, well, because when I was little, I made fun of the gift of tongues. I didn't really accept it. And they say, oh, you have rejected the Holy Spirit. You have committed the unpardonable sin. And I said, What? And I told my friend, I said, listen, Moses murdered people. Paul persecuted, murdered the church. Manasseh did every possible thing as bad that you can imagine. And God forgave them and many others that did other things. And he forgave all of them. And you're going to tell me that God is not going to forgive you because you laughed or you did not accept and made fun of this gift, supposed gift of tongues? I said, my brother, the unpardonable sin is when you reject the call of the Holy Spirit to repent. That is when you seal your fate, right? When it gets to a point where your heart is so hard that you will not listen to the voice of God. We see that in many places through the Pharaoh. We see that through Saul, right? They have rejected. But to say that, of course not. God will not forgive you. And that's not even the real tongues, right? And so I had to go down and break it down and study with him to him understand. And it took me about two years, but finally he did. And it was all an issue with this thing of the spirit again. I had to break it down and show him what is the spirit, what is the soul. We are talking again about the state of the dead and all these things because this is all a manifestation, this false spiritual manifestation that is happening inside the church and that is leading so many people. And notice, my loved ones, the Bible does not say you shall know them by their, by their gifts. The Bible says you shall know them by their fruits. And what is the fruit? Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Those, my loved ones, are carpet manifestations of the Spirit that everybody should be manifesting and growing in these things, my loved ones. But Matthew 7, 20 says, you shall know them by their fruits. That is what makes represented a Christian. Why? Because we have seen that the enemy can manifest and can create counterfeit gifts in this essence, my loved ones. And so this is what we're seeing, this distortion that is coming across. And it is rampant across all of Christianity because now this charismatic movement that has this false manifestation, this false revival, this false Pentecostal movement is grappling and grabbing everybody, almost all. You're seeing this across all Protestant denominations and these non-denominational churches too. And so the question is, my loved ones, we have to ask ourselves, is the spirit being manifested? Yes, there is a spirit. The question is, which spirit is being manifested? And so when you look at it again, how do we know if that manifestation of the spirit is correct? First John chapter four, verse one and six. Believe, beloved, my loved ones, believe not every spirit, but test the spirit whether they are of God, because many false prophets, again, are gone out into the world. Hereby know we speak with the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And so we are to test the spirits to see if this spiritual manifestation is of God or if it's not. And what is that test? We talked about this in previous presentations. Isaiah 820, to the law and to the testimony. In other words, to the law and to the prophets, to the word of God. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them, my loved ones. And so if somebody comes across and is working miracles and prophesying and casting out demons and saying, oh, I'm doing this all in the name of the Lord and the Spirit of God is with me, but yet something as foundational and basic as the Word of God they are trampling on, they are, they are putting aside, we know that that is not the Spirit of God that is working in them because the Spirit of God is, says very clearly in the book of Acts, God gives His Spirit to those that obey. And so this, my loved ones, is the great. And sadly, and here's where it gets even more interesting, when you look and study and, and spend time with the, with the charismatic movement, people that follow it, and I have, I sat down and studied with them, what do they say about the law of God? They say the law of God is what? Oh, that's Old Testament that's done away with. We're not under the law, we're under grace, right? We talked about that in a previous presentation too. When they come up with all of these, these distortions of the word of God. 
Matthew chapter 7. I love how Jesus breaks this down because he breaks it down in such a clear and simple way. It's exactly what we're talking about. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 23. What does Jesus say? Oh, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, right? Those are Christians, a prophetic established manifestation. Lord, Lord, did we not what? One, prophesy in your name. There we go. Cast out demons in your name. There we go. And do mighty works in your name. There we go. We have the prophecy, the demons casting out, and mighty works, signs, symbols, miracles. And what does Jesus tell them? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice what? lawlessness, anomia, iniquity, transgressor of the law. So he's saying, how is it possible that you have all of these miracles and manifestations of the Spirit when something as basic and foundational as the Word of God you are ignoring and the Ten Commandments, which are the purpose of the Ten Commandments is to show us what? To show us the righteousness and the glory and the character and holiness of God and show us contrary sin. And so what, my loved ones? Let's go back to this list that I showed you in a previous presentation about the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity. Now remember, this, com this list comes off of the Vatican website itself. And this is a list of the churches that have already, already signed the initial agreements toward this ecumenical movement to consolidate. And look at this list, the Orthodox churches, the Lutherans, the Anglicans, the World Communion of Reformed churches, the Methodist churches. Who else is involved in this, my loved ones? Baptist, Christian Church, the Disciples of Christ, Mennonites, World Evangelical Alliance, and look at this last group, some Pentecostal groups. Now remember, I told you and I mentioned to you that the last time this page was updated was in the year 2005. Now it has rained a lot since then here. Have these some Pentecostal groups finally decided to get on board? Oh yes, my loved ones. Recently there was a celebration between P Pentecostals and Catholics in the United States called Kairos, right? And so you have Kenneth Copeland and you had cardinals coming together and meeting. But I, I'll show you this. I think this is probably the best evidence that I came across. So there's abundance of evidence, but this, this uh, speaks so clearly. Look at this. This is from the Vatican uh, News. This is May 30th, 2017. It says, in Rome... Catholic charismatic renewal to celebrate 50 years. Ooh, what? Watch this. Some 30,000 fo 30, followers of the Catholic charismatic renewal will be what? Will be meeting, will be this week to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the movement with meetings and mass culminating in a prayer vigil led by who? By Francis in the Circus Maximus. What? Yes. In Catholicism, you have a charismatic movement, my loved ones. It is growing and growing fast. And this is what's bringing this movement together. Look at what it says. On the vigil of Pentecost, the Pope will address participants during an ecumenical prayer vigil. Notice how the charismatic movement is doing what? It's being used in the context of what? Of, of ecumenical movement, right? Organizers told journalists Tuesday that they expect participants to hail from some 220 countries from around the world. Of these, pay attention, 300 are evangelical or Pentecostal leaders. Ooh, amazing, my loved ones. Pope Francis met with members of the Catholic Charismatic Renewal at Rome gathering in 2014 and 15. Speaking June 1st, 2014, the Pope voiced hope that both evangelical and Catholic charismatic groups would share the same office as, the, as a sign of ecumenism. There it is, my loved ones, coming together. He is attendance for two consecutive years to the Catholic charismatic movement's renewal with the Spirit, convo, with the Spirit convocation and his planned participation during this year's Golden Jubilee celebration show how his attention to charismatic movements as a means to foster an ecumenical path and dialogue. My loved ones, amazing. This charismatic movement is what is consolidating, and you now see it across the board, not only in Catholicism, not only in non-denominationals, but we're seeing it in most, some of the churches that used to be Protestant churches. And what are the two things that is joining this movement? What are the two, glue, the two things that are gluing this? First, it's Sunday worship. And second, is this spiritualistic charismatic movement that is now joining all of the churches together, my loved ones. And this is prophecy happening before our very eyes. And some people say, what? 
How could this be happening? Well, look at this. Here's a book called Evangelicals and Catholics Towards a Common Mission Together, page 97. Look at what it says here. The spread of the charismatic movement through songs, prayers, and worship styles going well beyond officially charismatic circles has done a great deal to reduce the barriers between Catholics and evangelicals. Through what? Songs, prayers, and worship styles, my loved ones. And that's what we're seeing among, right? We're seeing this, this, uh, this, they call it the manifestation of the spirit, right? And you see the singing, right? And the dancing and the shaking and the moving and it, oh, it's all, and you see everything about, right? And then you come joining this gift of tongues and you're seeing the percussion and it's all just one big happy party. And they're dancing and jumping and singing and little by little and this, oh, this is the spirit manifesting itself, right? Now I have a question, my loved ones. Is this what God intended for his worship to be like is this what it is and people go oh well back in the times of David they were they were doing they were dancing well that first of all that was a different type of dance and second of all that was celebration but any time God's people came to the sanctuary any time they came in the presence of God it was in reverence and humility it was to be it was humbled my loved ones and so people question, oh, they say, you Seventh-day Adventists, you don't have the Spirit. I'm sorry. The purpose of the Spirit is to convince us of, convict us of sin, righteousness, judgment, right? It's to get us to obey God. It's to follow and live by God's Word. It's to live a life of happiness, of holiness, right? Upright living, righteous living. Not this manifestation that seems more like an apparent manifestation of what was happening after they came out of Egypt when they, had, when they built the calf. And that's exactly what was happening when Moses came down. And so... We start to question and answer, is this what it is? Is that what the purpose of this music? And so you're seeing, and here's the sad part, my loved ones, we're seeing this manifested in our own church today too, right? With the same worship styles and the same songs and prayers, right? The, the, these contemplative prayer styles, these Eastern meditation styles are all coming in, right? And the emptying of the mind, and we're seeing all of this come in, and it's coming also into our church. And you know what it tells me? It tells me that we're close to the end. Because that's what always has happened, my loved ones. The devil has always been attacking and persecuting and trying to get God's people to deviate from the true worship by introducing this false style and system of worship. And that's what we see. Is that how God's service, is that how God's worship is to be carried out? No, my loved ones. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33 and 40. It says, For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints, all things should be done decently and in order. Now, this is it, my loved ones. Was music created, right, to, to, uh, to entice our fallen flesh? No, my loved ones. F music was created to ele elevate our mind to the throne of God, to contemplate His beauty, His glory, His holiness. But that's not what it's being used today, and we're seeing all of these manifestations, my loved ones. These are characteristics, and you can point them out, and you can hard to see how these tendencies are, crying to, are starting to grow, uh, grow bigger and bigger and bigger inside of our church. And what does that tell me, my loved ones? Luke chapter 21, verse 31. So also we see these things taking place. You know that the kingdom of God is what? The kingdom of God is near. And so we have to be very cautious. We have to take care and watch out. Take care of those edges that sometimes we think are not as important. And we're letting these tendencies come in and dominate our church. My loved ones, people say, oh, you seven Adventists, why don't you dance? Right? They were dancing. And as I said before, the word dance, if you study it in Hebrew, it's not to the, 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 the shakalaka that we see today where everybody's shaking and dancing. It was a jumping in circles. If you've ever seen a Jewish wedding, they see they tie together. First of all, the men are separated from the woman and they're jumping in circles. That's what it means to jump, little jumps. Right? And also I say people, well, listen, there was a time of celebration. Don't get me wrong. And we will celebrate in heaven the right way. But right now we are in the day of atonement, right? And on the day of atonement, what was the church doing? It was a, the church should be afflicting their soul, right? Prayer, confession, uh, fasting, trying to find out if we are right so that God not only can prepare me, but can use me to prepare others, right? This is not the time for celebration. It doesn't mean that we're not rejoicing and singing to God and praising God. What it means is that there is a special moment, a special mission for us in these times that we should be focused on and that now is not the time for that type of celebration. But my loved ones, this is the things that we are seeing and this is bringing everything, it's bringing it all together. And what does it say? Go back with me please to Revelation chapter 16 because this is what it's explaining is that this charismatic movement plus the Sunday worship is going to be bringing this together and make consolidating this ecumenical movement that is the first step in what? The first step in then what? Pushing 
as Christians and evangelicals come together, Catholics come together in the United States, they are then going to, remember, we talked about 70 to 75% of the population, they're then just going to start to impose their will on congressmen, right? They're going to start to pressure them, and they're, going to, they're not going to fold. They're not going to stand up for, for, for separation of church and state because they what? They only care about staying in power. And it says in Revelation chapter 16, verse 14 through 16, Revelation chapter 16, 14 through 16, that through this deceptions, right, the spirit of demons and performing signs and great, and it goes, which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty, verse 16, and they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. And so as this all comes together, this is where Revelation chapter 12, 17 comes. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which them that do what? That keep the commandments of God, and what else? And have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And so this war is going to be carried out, my loved ones. First, these are the first steps, and we're seeing this happen. And I mean, we're living in some amazing times as we're seeing these prophecies, as we're seeing these signs happen. They're going to be coming together, this movement, my loved ones, and as they pressure to try to impose, right, these Christian laws, these Sunday's laws, and they're, as they impose this, politicians are going to go forth. The president, the executive branch is not going to, uh, uh, is not going to invalidate it. He's going to sign it. Right? Judicial branch, they're going to let it go through because they're going to say it's unconstitutional. Why? Because, of course, we already talked about all of this, of how Catholicism is, permeates in governments and dominates. And when the evangelicals come together, my loved ones, what's going to happen? That's when these laws are going to be imposed. And, of course, as these laws are imposed, then begins persecution, right? The small time of trouble. But as things get worse... And worse and worse, as probation closes and the plagues begin to fall, what are they going to do? The same thing that happened during the times of Elijah. When Acab, what did he do? He, he blamed Elijah for the mishaps. And what? A persecution. And then that's when the wrath, when the Holy Spirit steps back and all of the fallen carnal desires of these men and women are manifested with no restriction and loan limitations, guess what? They're going to blame those that want to be faithful to God and keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. Those that want to live an upright, holy life, that want to live according to the principles of heaven, they're going to be a, a, a thorn in their side and they're going to say, let's kill them, let's end with them, let's finish them, my loved ones. And that's what it says, my loved ones, that this great tribulation will stand in the end times. But... My loved ones, let us not fear because God has always said he will protect us and be with us until the very end. And so this is this pan prophetic panorama that is going to happen, my loved ones, and we will see it unfold a little bit better in our next presentation as we go a little bit deeper into this and we see how this is all going to unfold and unravel. We talked a little bit about the second coming of Jesus Christ at the beginning. We're going to touch back on this because as this is happening, as all of the plagues are falling, as this great tribulation is happening, as the powers of the earth are coming against us, what's going to happen is that God is going to liberate us. God is going to free us as he did for the plagues of Egypt. And so I say to you, thank you. Keep on coming as we keep on studying and prepare for the second coming of Christ.